Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar on cardiovascular psychophysiology. My name is Angela Robinson, and I'm a member of the Graduate Student Committee for SPISI, or the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. Today's event is a joint effort of SPISI and the American Psychological Association of Graduate Students, and this is the second event in our joint series of methodology webinars. So we have one hour for today's event, and before the main event, which will be Will's presentation, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, then you'll briefly hear from staff members at SPISI and APAGS about upcoming events and opportunities, and then we'll turn it over to Will for today's presentation. During the last 10 to 20 minutes of the hour, our presenter will respond to audience member questions. Um, so just to briefly touch on housekeeping items, all of the attendees are currently in listen-only mode. After today's webinar, you'll have access to a recording of the webinar via YouTube, and Will's slides will also be available in PDF format. Will is going to answer questions at the end of his presentation, but feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar using the chat feature. So now I'd like to introduce Eddie, who's going to say a few words about upcoming APAG's initiatives. Thank you, Angela, and hey, everybody. My name is Eddie Amin. I'm the, uh, the new director of an office at APA called the Office on Early Career Psychologists. Um, I'm just two doors down the hall from my old job, which was assistant directing APAGS, better known as American Psychological Association of Graduate Students. Um, and when I um, got together with the folks at SPISI to design and, and help kind of get these webinars to you, um, I was uh, representing graduate students and um, welcoming them to APA. So we are home to about 25,000 students who desire to improve society through psychology. There's four staff in the in the APAG's office and we are governed by uh, both elected and appointed student leaders um, who are in graduate programs across the U.S. and Canada. I'm saying this because I want you to know that a lot of the policies and directions that APA takes is very much decided upon by our membership. And there's also opportunities if you're a grad student member to consider this as well. Uh, uh, our, our goal is to build a better future for psychology by serving as a united voice to enrich and advocate for graduate student development. No matter um, where you're currently at in your graduate training uh, or your early career and where you'd like to be and what your dream job is, we hope to augment the things that you learn uh, in your classroom and in your field placements and so forth with, uh, with materials that can help you be a better advocate, a better leader. Um, and a more supported, connected, networked, engaged um, professional. Our current strategic plan is to end the internship crisis, to develop powerful training opportunities for scientists, and to create a culture of leadership in psychology. Uh, on that last note, we're about to kick off a brand new uh, Apex Leadership Institute, a very competitive cycle of applications were reviewed and will be embarking on a year-long leadership training program with a small group of students. Um, I, I always tell people to join for four big reasons. Uh, if you're already a member, then this is just a reminder. If you're not a member of APAGS already, uh, please consider it. And um, I think you'll be glad that you do get this exposure that you might not get um, from just being a student alone without any professional associations. So number one is the community. Um, I mentioned that we're the, the largest association, um, but one of the ways you can also experience community is by showing up in person. Um, we have an annual convention, and this year we're in the Mile High City. We'll be in Denver from August 4th through 7th, so I highly encourage you to come by. APAG's always done a, does a ton of um, cool things like free breakfast every morning of convention uh, and a food for thought workshop series. We also have a big party on Thursday night. Um, it's a lot of fun, a lot of ways that you can uh, link up with APAGS and save on your incidental costs uh, while attending convention. Uh, as a member of, of APA or graduate student affiliate, of APA, you'll receive 13 issues of academic journals, 10 issues of the Monitor on Psychology, and four issues of Grad Psych Magazine. Um, you'll receive, and, and that's per year. Um, you'll have access to over $200,000 in grants and awards that APA gives out to students. And then, of course, you can participate in a number of different professional development opportunities that you see on your screen. Uh, so, 
I want to direct you to our uh, APEGS webpage. That's apa.org slash APEGS, as well as our Facebook page. You can like us on Facebook and get um, daily updates of fresh content, uh, things from around APA and then also from uh, from the field of psychology at large. Here, just on your screen right now, some of the, the things that you can download for free uh, or access for free on the APEGS webpage. Click resources for students when you get to apa.org slash apags. So that's it for me. I hope you enjoy the webinar. I know Will is really excited and has some tremendous material to present to you. Great. Thanks so much, Eddie. And now we'll hear from Sarah about upcoming opportunities from SIFI. Thanks, Angela. Um, I'm Sarah Mancall. I'm at the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. And I just want to alert everyone who's on the webinar today that we have a number of grant opportunities and honors coming out. Uh, so please apply. We have the Michelle Alexander Early Career Award for Scholarship and Service. This award is open to anyone who is within 10 years of his or her doctoral having already obtained a doctoral degree. We also have two grant programs that are open to graduate students. One is grants and aid, and the next deadline for this is October 10th. Um, and this program is really to support scientific research on social problems that are aligned with species goals and are especially not likely to receive support from traditional sources. We also have the Clara Mayo Grants Program, and this program specifically supports master's theses and pre dissertation research on sexism, racism, or prejudice. Uh, we also have a number of fellowship opportunities. Every year we have a James Marshall Public Policy Fellow who has a placement in Congress. Uh, the next deadline is February 1st for the 2017-2018 academic year. And the Dulmas A. Taylor Memorial Summer Minority Policy Fellowship Program, uh, we are currently uh, thinking about fellows for next summer. So if you think you might be interested, please apply by March 1st. And you can learn a lot more on our website at spissy.org. In addition, I want to alert you to a research methods um, book that Spissy has put out by Jeffrey Murayama and Carrie Ryan. You have all the information here. And please save the date. Our next webinar will be on July 13th, 2016 at 2 p.m. Eastern with Juan Del Toro on autoregressive latent trajectory analysis. And thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you to both Eddie and Sarah, who have both been instrumental in making this whole series possible. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce our presenter for today, who is Will Ryan. He's a PhD student at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His research interests center on the psychophysiological dynamics of social threat, and his current work explores these processes in the domains of homophobia, coming out, and gender-based self-control. Will is also interested in psychophysiological methodology. He spends a considerable amount of his time working on developing and testing new methods for assessing cardiovascular reactivity, so we're very lucky to have him sharing his expertise with us today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Will for today's event. Um, and uh, it'll just take us a moment here to transition to make Will the presenter. Um, but thank you very much, Will, for speaking today. Thanks. Um, let me just make this uh, official slideshow. OK. So hello. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to my very first webinar. It's a little weird to be talking to you all without an actual audience here, um, but I'm going to make the best of this. So um, just so you have a face to put to the disembodied voice. Um, wait, now my controls are not working. There we go. Here's a face to put to the disembodied voice. So here I am serving as a guinea pig for a cold press experiment that I ran with their friend and collaborator. Um, but more importantly, so the goal of today's webinar is to provide an overview and an introduction to cardiovascular physiology. This is a topic that has a lot of com com complexities from theoretical to the technical. So this workshop will, by, will be by no means comprehensive. Um, when I've conducted workshops in the past, 
Um, they've usually lasted at least a couple hours to multiple days. So given that we only have about half an hour to 40 minutes before I turn to your questions, I'm going to focus this webinar on information that's most pertinent to researchers who are just beginning to incorporate cardiovascular measures in their research or who are wondering whether this is the type of research that they'd like to pursue. Um, so these slides are going to be available in PDF format afterward, and I think there's also going to be a, a, um, a, um, a um recording of this, so you'll be able to access all of this. And um, because it's so short, I tried to make a point of including a lot of references so you can look up things more later. Um, so the full references will be at the end. And then I also made a shorter list of sort of my top papers or resources, especially for people who are getting into this. Um, so um, handbooks and chapters. All right. So. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties with my notes here. Here we go. So briefly, here's what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to begin by defining cardiovascular physiology and situating it within the broader um, physiological literature. Then I'm going to talk about a, um, a very important topic of inferring physiological states from, um, of um, inferring psychological states from physiological markers. Then I'm going to turn to two major theories slash bodies of work in social psychophys. Um, so the first being the biopsychosocial model of challenge and threat, and the second being polyvagal theory. I chose these two theories not just because um, they're important theoretically, but they're also, um, they both examine different aspects of the autonomic nervous system. So it gives us a chance to talk about the functioning of each. And then lastly, and if there's time, I'm going to briefly go through some of sort of the more technical aspects of collecting these measures um, if you were to do this, this, this kind of work in, in your lab. All right, so to start, just a really brief history. Our understanding of the mind-body problem um, or the relation of the psychological experience to, to biological form has evolved a lot over the years. Um, so we began with Cartesian dualism, which posited that the psyche and the body are, dis, are, dis, um, are distinct, um, existing in separate spheres. So the idea that mental activity is, de, is, de, is decoupled from the physical structure and activity of the brain and body. Um, and then around in the 50s, we moved to um, the identity thesis, um, where in this view, um, the brain is the control of the body. Um, psychological states are understood to have specific, identifiable biological underpinnings. Um, so, in this view, um, holds that mental events can be grouped into types and that they can be correlated with physical structures and processes of the brain. Uh, so, this position has developed and expanded to where we are today, where we continue to work on mapping the biological underpinnings of psychological states, but we also recognize that the mind and body are intricately connected and communicate dynamically. Um, so we're only just beginning to understand the ways in which this bidirectional co communication occurs, but sort of this is the arena of psycho psychophysiology as it stands. Uh, obviously, I have, a st I have a stutter, and it's worse on that word. I don't know why I chose to study this. Um, anyway, got to make things difficult for myself. All right, there's that. We're not going to the next one. There we go. So, as a general field, psychophys has a general um, has two two um, general assumptions that derive from that identity thesis that we just talked about. And so, these are that the contents and processes of mental life derive from brain structures, um, and that the brain controls the body and its operational systems. And so, because it is, if you follow from these assumptions, the idea is that we can measure. Um, brain activity or activation in the body that follows from that, and we can use these measures to determine the physiological signatures that are associated with um, specific psychological states. So those are sort of the goals of psychophys. Um, and there's a lot of different types of psychophysiology. You could consider um, neuro some of um, neuroscience to, uh, to um, fall within that category, so fMRI work, EEG, EFNERS, um, um, endocrine work looking at um, cortisol and oxytocin and catecholamines, but where we're going to focus today obviously is on the cardiovascular type of psychophysiology, um, looking at heart rate, blood flow, and blood and blood bound pressure, and um, the, basically the, the um, 
functioning of the cardiovascular system. So just to situate us a little bit more, when we're using cardiovascular measures, we're, act we're measuring activity that is in the autonomic um, um, nervous system. So uh, branching us down here from the peripheral nervous system, we're looking at a subset of that, the autonomic nervous system, so the system that controls um, things that are not within our um, voluntary control, so not muscle movements, um, but heart rate, um, in, 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 in intestines, and just the functioning of your organs and um, a lot of your peripheral uh, nervous system. And so then within that uh, further, so what we're measuring in this is that we're um, specifically looking at the influence of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems on the heart and the, and, and the vasculature. So um, cardiovascular physiology is um, looking at the activity of these two systems on the um, heart and um, blood um, vessels and arteries. Oh, that slide's a little weird, but just you might recall from an undergraduate course that the sympathetic nervous system is what's, imp what's implicated in controlling fight or um, flight responses. It activates you. It um, is the source of the arousal that accompanies those states. Um, and weird, okay? And the parasympathetic nervous system um, is what is implicated in assisting in recovery. Um, following arousal. Of course, it's not that simple. These two systems don't necessarily turn on and off in opposition to one another. They're both always on, so to speak, but um, we can talk about the relative um, dominance and their opposing effect on heart rate and other measures of interest here. So what is cardiovascular physiology? So um, at least in our lab, the, what, um, what um, we measure is we use electrocardiograms or um, ECG to look at the activity of the heart. That's the electrical activity that we're measuring there. We also use blood blood pressure measures to look at um, con continuous um, fluctuations in, in blood pressure over time. Um, we measure it using the um, fingers. And we also use impedance uh, cardiography, which allows us to look at blood, blood flow in the um, torso. So it's a way of indexing. Um, the functioning of the heart. Um, so what are some of the measures that we get out of this? Um, we can look at heart rate. You can look at heart rate variability. Um, there's also pre-ejection period and cardiac output, which um, get at the functionality of the heart, how much um, blood it's pumping and how hard it's pumping. We're going to go a little more into these as this goes on. Um, and so, and then also mean arterial pressure and total peripheral resistance, which are derived in part from blood blood pressure. So it gives us a window into um, the resistance in the vasculature. So, but if the goal is to um, find physiological indexes of psychological states, why not just go directly to the central nervous system and look at those there? Certainly people do, and that's a really interesting area of work, but there are some um, disadvantages to doing things like fMRI, uh, namely cost and sort of the, um, the um, restricted nature of being within a magnet. So some of the benefits of using cardiovascular measures is that um, yeah, relative to a lot of central nervous system measures, they're lower in cost, they're less intrusive and um, restricting. There's more and more um, coming out with ways to measure these while people are moving around. Um, it won't be long before the Fitbit is able to calculate these things at a level where we could use them for um, research. There's already some devices available that um, I and others have been um, playing around with. Um, but also benefits of cardiovascular measures are relative to self-report self and other types of measures is that um, the activity of the body can be measured continuously and without, um, so people can't change that at, at, at will. So it's not, um, su it's not subject to the same sort of um, reporting biases that a self-report measure might be. So there's benefits there in being able to look at psychological states that people may not be willing or able to um, report on. 
So just to sum that up, cardiovascular physiology is a means of indexing and activation of the autonomic nervous system and its subcomponents, so the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. It also, uh, so it, it assesses the activity of the heart and the flow of blood and blood um, pressure. And um, it's, what's exciting about it is that you can measure processes that are not necessarily under conscious con con control, um, although I put a star there because more and more there's research coming out on mindfulness about how you can um, sort of use bodily feedback and to control some of the activities of the heart. And then finally that um, cardiovascular measurement can provide information about disposition and psychological state, um, responses to stress, health status, and, and more. So, so the overarching goals of cardiovascular psychophysiology are to understand how cardiovascular systems relate to centrally controlled effective cognitive and motivational processes and to use these to index psychological constructs and measure critical independent and dependent variables um, and to understand how embodied somatic activity influences psychological processes. So how what your, what your body is is doing feeds back to um, influence uh, memory, emotion, and social cog cog cognition, among other things. So now I want to turn, so before we sort of get into more of the nitty gritty, I want to turn to a really important topic when doing this type of work is thinking about what types of inferences you can make using psychophysiological data. Um, so, let's see. so considering the types of inferences that we can make, we have to consider the relation between psychophysiological response and the psychological cons, con, construct that is of interest to us as a researcher. So ideally we want the physiological response that we're measuring to have a one-to-one -one relationship with the psychological construct. So this is illustrated here. So this, an example of this would be um, an immunologist that is indexing a certain disease um, that's marked by the presence of a specific antibody. So that antibody indicates that disease and no other disease. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. If you have that physical marker, you have that disease. Um, there are not um, too many, if any, um, psychological constructs that, that work like this. Um, so we want to be careful that we're not drawing one-to-one -one infer inferences where that's not um, called for. And yeah this, is, yeah, this is particularly difficult in psychophys because the constructs of interest are difficult to define and isolate from others. They're complicated um, and physiological systems are interrelated and they're activated under a variety of circumstances. So it doesn't necessarily make sense, especially in the realm of cardiovascular activity, to be looking for one thing that would be active only in one specific type of psychological state. So um, another possibility is that the psychological construct and physiological response would have a one-to-many relationship. So an example of this would be if the psychological construct was fear, um, that can be indexed by a variety of physiological responses, um, such as increases in heart rate and a um, startle response, skin conductance. Um, so that would be one psychological construct to many physiological responses. And then you can also have a many to one, um, which is essentially the opposite, where there are many psychological constructs that map on to the physiological response. So an example that we're going to talk about later is heart rate variability. So this would be the physiological response, and that can has been mapped on to a lot of different psychological constructs, uh, including individual differences in um, uh, resilience and um, state differences in affiliation, stress, things like that. So um, it, that one construct can map onto a variety of different things. Another possibility is that we have a many-to-many -many relationship. Um, we see this quite often 
where, for example, anger, stress, and fear, they're all related to each other in some ways, and so there's multiple overlapping physiological responses to each. Um, so that would be an example there. So, but, so what's really important when we're measuring these things in the lab is that we're making sure that the thing that we're measuring, the physiological response, that we're not interpreting that as meaning something other than what it means. Um, so we want to make sure that we're making valid inferences. And so we want to be able to have the sort of maximum inferential ability. So ways that we can in, 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 increase that so that, for instance, you could assess anger um, even though it overlaps with other psychological states is that you can constrain the situation. So you can provoke somebody so that if you see a, a reaction in heart rate or skin conductions or something like that, you can pretty much be sure that it's due to the event that just occurred. If you're just measuring that at rest or after an ambiguous task, you can't be sure that the person is angry uh, rather than um, maybe excited or turned on or some other state that's also associated with high arousal. Um, you can also consider the temporal relationship between constructs so you can see how quickly um, a response comes on after, after a um, event that can help you to sort of zoom in on what was um, the psychological sort of reason behind that that can help you to determine the state. Um, and you can also consider the magnitude of change. So if heart rate only goes up a little bit, it might just be that you're engaged with something, where if it's going up a lot, that might mean that you're afraid. Of course, there are better ways to measure that, but it's something you can, that you can consider in making inferences. And then um, perhaps most importantly is that you can use a constellation of measures or a multi-measure index. So what that would look like with this is that a psychological construct, A, would map on to a sort of patterning of multiple physiological constructs. And so those things, those same physiological systems might change with other psychological constructs, but not in the same pattern. So that pattern would be distinct to that psychological construct. So this is what we would call a one-to-one -one index. All right. So now I'm going to turn to a little bit of theory. So early psychophys work focused primarily on arousal. Um, broadly speaking, you can't see my air quotes around arousal, um, but it was presumed to be associated with negative outcomes always. And so since then, of course, our view of stress has become much more com com complex. So there, we know now that there are multiple types of stressors. There are physical and psychological stressors. Um, Stressors can require active versus passive coping, so needing to give a public speech or give a webinar would be a active, uh, would be a type of um, a um, stressor that um, requires active coping, whereas needing to sit back and watch a scary movie or um, be exposed to something traumatic that may require passive coping. Um, there are also acute versus chronic stressors, which is an important just some dis, um, distinction, particularly in terms of health outcomes, but so a, a um, stressor can be brief and short or it can be drawn out over a long period of time. So it's important when you're doing this work to just consider which type of stress you're wanting to look at and make sure that you're um, indexing that accordingly. Um, so one of so the biopsychosocial model of challenge and threat is one of the theories I want to focus on today. And so it followed from a few other theories that um, sort of questioned the idea that, that reactivity or arousal was maladaptive. And so um, it, yeah, it, among other theories, said that, um, that reactivity is not inherently bad or maladaptive. And it's a good example of a theory that sort of uses the inferential principles we talked about to um, in in, increase its ability to um, assess psychological states. So it examines specifically motivated performance situations. So it can it could it constrains the situation to one where you that um, that um, requires an active response where there's a where it's goal relevant. There's some sort of evaluative context. Um, something's happening there in that situation. Um, and it also uses a multiply determined index to assess psychological state. I think it's an empirical question whether that's a one to one index, um, 
but you know we could still find that there are other psychological states indexed by that. But um, to this point, it seems like there that was too that that that, that the patterns that it um, that it that it proposes map well onto the psychological states that it's attempting to index, namely challenge and threat. So this theory has its theoretical roots in um, psychological toughness, which is a work comes from work by Dienst, Dienst, Dienstbier. Um, and so his work was really the first to counter the view that reactivity is uniformly associated with negative health outcomes. And so um, and then it also draws on Lazarus and Folkman's appraisal theory um, because it focuses on the role of appraisal processes in shifting psychological, sorry, in shifting physiological, emotional, and, and behavioral responses. So this is the part where psychology comes in in terms of our own appraisals, our own cons con construals of the situation Im impact um, psychological and emotional states. So from Dean Spears' theory of psychological toughness and weakness, um, so he posited that the activation of the SAM or sympathetic adrenal medullary axis is associated with benign states. So that would be adaptive um, activity. So whereas, I'm going to come back to those, whereas the hypothal hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical axis or the HPA um, that this was what was associated with maladaptive states, um, either alone or with activation of the SAM axis. So he was studying this in rats and he found that it was this latter type of stress that was leading them to die, uh, not the former. And so um, indeed he was talking about two very important systems. So the sympathetic adrenal medullary axis is the component of the sympathetic nervous system control pathway. And so it's what's activated um, in sort of the fight or flight response immediately. It's activated quickly. There's a relatively faster um, recovery from it. So its goal is to mobilize energy for combating a short-term or acute stressor. Um, so for example, running from a lion is the example always used. Um, the HPA axis, on the other hand, is implicated in major or chronic stressors. So, and it's the long-term activation of this system that leads to the negative health outcomes that we associate with stress. Um, so challenge and threat theory uses cardiovascular measures to assess the relative activation of these two systems to index psychological states. Oh, and it's slower to um, recover. So I don't want to go into this. I just put this here for those who are interested in those two pathways. This is a figure that I made that just maps out the SAM axis and HPA axis and um, some of the physiological effects of that. So the biopsychosocial model of challenge and threat posits that in motivated performance situations, uh, motivational and concomitant physiological states are, is determined by the appraised ratio of resources relative to task demands. So this is where appraisal theory comes in. So um, where resources are evaluated to exceed or match task demands, um, a, challenge a challenge motivational state results. This state is characterized by greater SAM activation relative to HPA activation. So it's, um, it's, it's the adaptive type of activation here. And then the reverse is true for threat motivational states. Here, demands exceed resources. So these are people's appraisal of demands and resources. So for example, if you're going to take a test, demands could be how difficult it is. Um, and resources could be things like having slept a full night, having eaten well, having studied, having social support, things like that. Um, and so when demands outweigh uh, resources, then there's, rel there's a greater relative H HPA activation than SAM activation. So basically this is treated as a major or chronic stressor. And um, so uh, cortisol is released and um, different patterns of activation occur that we'll look at in a moment. So index and challenge and threat, as I said, involves looking at a combination of multiple cardiovascular measures. So um, we always first test for task, task engagement, which is, which is indexed by looking at heart rate, 
and pre-ejection period, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about what that is later, but it's sort of a measure of cardiac efficiency. Um, and so, um, that doesn't seem right. Yes, okay, that's correct. Um, so in, in both challenge and threat states, um, we're looking for task engagement first. So here we see that we would expect to see the same patterns of activation for both, but if someone's not task engaged, then we can't call this a motivated performance situation. So we wouldn't proceed with the rest of our analyses, but so we would expect um, increases relative to a baseline measure in both heart rate and a decrease in pre-ejection period, basically the heart pumping more forcefully here. Um, then to, do, to, to look at the differences in challenge and threat, um, with challenge, we expect cardiac output to go up. We expect the heart to be beating more effectively, pumping more blood with each beat, and total peripheral resistance to go down. Um, so this is, means that the blood vessels are dilating to accommodate extra blood flow, so we're not seeing an in, in, in increase in, in, in um, blood pressure overall. In a threat state, we wouldn't expect cardiac output to go up. Um, because the heart is not necessarily beating more effectively here, and um, total peripheral resistance may either increase or stay about the same. So it's really these last two sets of things that we're looking at to, to, to look at the differences between these two psychological states. So challenge and threat studies tend to follow a basic experimental design where there's a pre-survey of some sort, then you tape them up to all of the physiological measures. Um, we call it taping up because we use a mylar tape for some of it, um, then there's usually a baseline, so you're taking a resting measure, um, and then there's a manipulation or a manipulation that's embedded within the task itself that they do next, and so throughout the baseline and the task, you're taking physiological measures, and then afterward, there might be some type of post-survey looking at um, one of your dependent variables of, of interest. So what we're looking at always is cardiovascular reactivity, so the change relative to baseline. This helps us to account for individual differences and sort of where they start um, and also how reactive um, they might be to um, different things. Right. So I'm not going to go into these, but just for those who are interested in challenge and threat theory, um, some studies that have examined situational and interpersonal influences, but then there's also work um, looking at individual differences in sort of propensity to experience challenge and threat states in different circumstances. So, um, yes, I'm just going to speed up because obviously we're getting already short on time, but I don't have too much more left. So the last, so the second theory that I wanted to talk a little bit about is polyvagal theory because this sort of addresses the other half of the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system. So polyvagal theory was developed by Stephen Porges. It's got many papers, books, chapters um, on this topic. And so the vagus nerve is the primary pathway of the parasympath parasympathetic nervous system uh, connecting the, to the heart and other parts of the body. Um, so there it is there. This is what we're focusing in on. So you can see it has um, um, projections to all these critical areas. And so key to polyvagal theory is that the vagus nerve has two functionally distinct branches. So the first sort of being our early evolved or primitive branch, this is the branch that elicits immobilization behaviors or the freeze response when we're exposed to stress, so playing dead. And then the more recently involved branch elicits social connection and self-soothing behaviors in regards in um, response to, to uh, stress. So the vagus nerve in short, uh, regulates emotional expression and social connection. So individuals can differ in their vagal tone or tension, um, which sort of which um, reflects the relative strength of the innervation of the vagus nerve to the um, peripheral systems. So it reflects chronic individual differences in the strength of peripheral nervous system activity. So it can serve as an index of the, basically the functional state of the parasympathetic nervous system. So indiv these individual differences have been associated with um, when there's greater vagal tone, there's uh, associated with greater affiliation, positive affect, optimism, whereas logo, lower vagal tone is associated with depression, anxiety, and negative health outcomes. So it, vagal tone can't be indexed directly, but it can be inferred by looking at its influence on respiratory sinus arrhythmia, RSA, which is a type of heart rate variability. 
Um, and so uh, greater variability is indicative of greater vagal tone. So this is image just sort of looking at heart rate variability. You can see that there's um, different distances between each beat of the heart. So that's, that's the um, variability that we're interested in uh, characterizing. And so just a little bit about how that works is that the sinonatrial odin node in the heart is what initiates the cardiac cycle, and it basically acts as a pacemaker um, for the heart, and it propagates an electrical signal through the heart, and it's what coordinates the contractions of the atria and ventricles, and it sets a pace of about 105 beats per minute. But our hearts don't usually beat that fast, and so that's where the parasympathetic nervous system comes in. So the vagus nerve um, innervates the heart, and it's what slows our heart rate down. So it's active when we breathe out, and it's suppressed when we breathe in. So it's, what, it's part of what contributes to heart rate variability, and it's what reduces our average resting heart rate to be about 60 to 80 beats per minute. And so it's sympathetic nervous system activation, like we talked about with challenge and threat, that can speed up the heart and, and increase con, con, um, contractile force. So yeah, the two systems have opposing influences. Not that they are on or off, but that the two that they they have different they have opposite act opposite effects on the heart. The parasympathetic or vagus nerve slows it down, and the sympathetic speeds it up. Um, so you can also look at changes in heart rate variability rather than individual differences. Um, so in reaction in response to specific stimuli or tasks. Um, or you can look at it in recovery following a stressor. So these are associated with basically state um, versions of some of the traits that we talked about before. And then we don't, I guess I'll just go through this really quickly. There's not much here, um, but people can ask questions about this. This is um, probably where there'd be most questions anyway. So what would this sort of look like in the lab? When we're measuring impedance cardiography, it involves either putting spot or tape electrodes um, around the neck and on the torso. Oh, this is actually ECG first. So the ECG electrodes are what measure the electrical activity of the heart. So that's what you're going to get heart rate or heart rate variability from. Um, you might need a third one if you're using a wireless ECG just to ground it. Um, and then for impedance cardiography, you've got these bands or spots around the neck and torso. And the outer bands are sending a low voltage electrical current, um, which is then then the um, resistance to that current is being measured through the inner bands. And so as blood volume in increases, that, um, that um, resistance de decreases because blood is a good, good conductor. So that's how we can get insight into sort of how the um, sort of, that's how we can get insight into when the aortic valve is opening and closing and the, and, and the functioning of the heart. Won't go into that, but that's just a figure of what waveforms from those look like for those who are interested. Um, and this is, again, I didn't even plan to go into this, but I just wanted to provide a table that sort of breaks down each of the cardiac measures, so heart rate, heart rate variability, stroke volume, cardiac output, and pre-ejection periods, says what it is, um, the, gives the underlying physiological mechanism, and says how it's calculated. And then it's sort of the same for blood pressure. Um, we're used to taking it as this sort of one-time measure at a doctor's office, but it can be measured con continuously over time. So we get um, a waveform just like we do with heart rate and blood flow, um, where at when the at the highest pressure we have the systole, so that's usually the, that's the top number on your blood pressure, um, and then when the vent when, when the ventricles are emptying and then you're at lowest pressure and that's the diastole so your lowest point of blood pressure so we can track these over time um, to look at changes in blood pressure as a task is occurring and then again I just wanted to provide a little table um, that sort of has what those are and how they're calculated um, all of the different blood pressure um, types of measurement and then just to end, if you're interested in doing this work, just some important considerations to think about are what type of study design you want to do. You want to increase your inferential ability. You want to think about whether you're looking at reactivity, whether you need baseline um, values that you're interested in alone if you're looking at trait differences, whether you want to look at a recovery from a, from a um, event or um, stressor, whether it's an active or passive task. 
You also need to consider the, the characteristics of the subjects you want to look at, so their health status, uh, medication, BMI, cardiovascular history. Like for example, my roommate studies chaff hunger, studies weight stigma. Cardiovascular measures aren't always the best for him because um, body mass index changes the properties of some of these things, and um, so it can make it difficult to um, interpret results. Um, you want to make sure you know what hardware and settings you're going to use, so whether you're going to get equipment from Acknowledge Mindware or some other sourcer, what your sampling rates, filter, filters, and amplification settings are. This is all the nitty-gritty stuff that I would love to cover in another webinar sometime. And then um, you want to make sure that you know how to score that data and how to interpret what you find. So there's lots of softwares available for scoring. Acknowledge and Mindware are two commercially available. Kubios is open source for heart rate variability, and MEEP, which is one that um, my colleague Matt Seaslack and I designed, should be available soon, and that is for blood pressure, um, impedance cardiography, and ECG. Uh, you want to make sure you know how to remove artifacts from that data, how to average it, score it, um, and then you also want to make sure you have a good understanding of the biological systems that underlie this. I was only able to give you a brief overview of that today. Um, and so it may sound overwhelming, but it's also a lot of fun to do this work. There's um, a lot of good stuff out there to read. Um, there's really interesting questions, and it really is a fertile ground for doing new research. Um, so I find it an exciting place to be. All right, so that's it for that, and let's do questions. All right, great. Thanks so much, Will. Um, so we've got a couple questions on deck, um, and I encourage people to submit other questions um, using the chat feature if you have questions for Will. Um, but first up, we have a question um, about blood pressure. Um, so this question is from Lori. Um, so why isn't blood pressure in its raw form included in the biopsychosocial model of challenge and threat? Um, is blood pressure by itself not important in discerning challenge from threat? So it's not included in its raw form in there, but it is directly included in the calculation of total peripheral resistance. Um, but I personally often look at mean arterial pressure, which is just a average of, um, let me go to it. So mean arterial pressure here, which is the average arterial pressure. So it's just a weighted average of diastolic and systolic blood pressure. So this is sort of the purest measure of just just the activity of the vasculature, whereas the total peripheral resistance includes cardiac output. Um, and the reason that they use total peripheral resistance in challenge and threat theory is it, it's the more global index. It includes the activity of the heart and the vasculature, so that's, and that's what is theorized to dis, dis, um, distinguish between adaptive and maladaptive states. When your total peripheral resistance goes up, um, it's that your vasculature isn't accommodating for the extra blood flow. So that's what they're trying to index there. Um, yes. Great. Thank you. Um, and now we have a question from Natalia. Um, and Natalia was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the um, kind of Fitbit type devices that your lab is using um, and kind of experimenting with. I'm sure lots of people would be interested in those types of kind of non-invasive um, sure, yeah. so devices. One that I'm trying out now in collaboration with um, Bell, Bell, um, Bell, Bell, Bell Ginger Sahadra at um, Australian Catholic University. is It's called the E4, and so it's made by Im, Impatica, and it's a lot like the Fitbit in how it looks, but it's one of the first ones that's just sort of designed for researchers because you can actually access all the data that you want. So that's the, I can make a list of these um, for people, so, and I'll add it to the slide so that this is written down. But the Impatica E4 allows you to look at um, some types of heart rate variability um, and skin temperature and some types of electrodermal response. Um, so I'm just now playing around with that. We ran a study just to try to validate it against the uh, more traditional biopack measures, which I'll say what those are in a second, but that's what we usually use in our lab. And I haven't analyzed that yet, so I can't say yet whether it's um, good or bad. But I'm sure there, I'm sure it works well. Um, but that's one option. And then there's I think there's an, one called Angel something. I'll look that up. But there's more and more all the time. I'm seeing new devices, so we're not quite there yet. It's not plug and play. There's still a lot of work to do. But I within five to ten years, we're, it's going to be really different what's available. So just 
look for that on the horizon. And if you want to leave that, that's definitely an area where people are looking for more work. Great. OK, oh, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. And then also in our lab, just the traditional measures we get from Biopack. There's an MP150 system and a CNAP monitor uh, for the blood pressure. Um, so they have all that on the Biopack website. Um, it just so happens that their headquarters is located near UCSB, and so we have a really good working relationship with them, but they make really excellent equipment as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, now we have a question from Alexander. Uh, so in terms of making inferences, do people typically use cardiovascular measures to predict psychological constructs, or do they use psychological constructs to predict CV measures? Um, and also, can CV measures be mediators? Yes, yes, and yes. So I've seen it be all of those different things, depending on the theory. Um, so within challenge and threat theory, they've used them to predict outcomes. So they, in one study, they had baseball players or students in the class talk about um, either just like why they would be a good friend or how they were going to do in the upcoming baseball season or, or class. And those physiological states predicted their performance. Um, also can see it used as a mediator, as sort of like in stereotype threat work. Um, there's been some work and needs to be more on sort of what's physiologically happening when people are being depleted um, by those processes, so it can be a mediator there. Um, and then I think also you can use them, I don't know if it's to predict states, but as like an indicator of a state that you might not be able to measure, so people have used it as indicator of um, prejudice or a threat in reaction to an outgroup member. So it can, you can really, depending on the theoretical approach you're using, and um, as long as you're constraining the situation appropriately and defining your construct well, you, you can act as sort of all of those different things, different places in the model. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question from Nicholas here, um, and his question is about um, kind of whether these measures can work for um, experiences that people are maybe watching a video rather than having the experience themselves. So the example that Nicholas gave was um, whether someone's vascular response might be similar if they watched a video of a person kind of watching a speech versus um, performing in the Trier task where they have to give a speech in a stressful situation. So they're definitely going to give you different results. I mean, they're going to be different states, especially just because there's differences that have to do with speaking and doing that sort of active task. Um, but there's no reason you can't measure things during a passive state. Um, you just, that's, you wouldn't use challenge and threat theory per se there because it's predicated on there being a motivated performance state. But you can still look at changes in blood pressure that would be indicative of feeling stressed or um, changes in heart rate. So you could still measure these things. You could still look at skin conductance. We didn't talk about that here. It's not cardiovascular, but there's still measures you can use to look at reactivity to that. You just yeah, want to make sure that it's for the right for the right reason, that it's because of the video that they're watching. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so um, now I have a question about um, whether it's important to measure blood pressure continuously. Um, so uh, I've got a question here. So my lab decided to buy a one-time blood pressure measurement device instead of a continuous measurement device. Um, so they measure it every five minutes, um, accompanied by continuous ECG and ICG and respiration. Um, so how important is it to measure blood pressure continuously? I mean, I think it's ideal to be able to do that, but it's not, it certainly isn't necessary, um, especially because a lot of the equipment that does measure it continuously uh, doesn't always actually do so because of artifact and things. So I think blood pressure is one that changes on the uh, on a on a um, slower scale. So I think it's fine to measure it at that level, and um, just want to make sure that you design your task accordingly. You certainly wouldn't want to do an event-related design with that. But as long as your tasks or trials or blocks of things are long enough that you're getting a measurement within that time frame, I think you can absolutely do that, and it, it may be the best option for lots of researchers. Great. OK, thanks. Um, so we've got time for one or two more questions. And we have a lot in the chat, so um, I'll just pick a couple out. Um, so the next question is about um, how, um, to what degree do people's self-reports of their psychological states tend to correlate with the physiological measures that you use? They don't 
correlate well at all. It really depends, again, on the context, and because you can imagine if you're measuring something like threat to an outgroup member, people are less likely to be able to report on that than um, you know, feeling really stressed, giving a public speech. Um, so it really depends on the context, but they often don't correlate, but sometimes, as in the Trier task, they do. Uh, it also depends on the individual. Some people have more what we call interoceptive awareness. They're more aware of what's happening in their body, um, and so they may be more accurately able to like detect when they're having a high arousal state um, and what type of arousal that is. Great, thank you. Are there any types of particular um, psychological states that maybe are more accurate than others um, in terms yeah. of people's self-report? In terms of people's self-report, um, do, do people have better insight in self-reporting certain types of psychological states compared to others? Yeah, I would say probably some of the emotions are easier to report on, like when you're afraid, things like that. Um, but again, it's, it's just really going to depend on the context in which that psychological state is emerging and whether they have, whether they're able to make the appraisal to the right um, source, right? So there's all sorts, it's not that, you know, it's easy to detect when our heart is beating quickly, but your self-report's not going to correlate with even that recognition if you think it's for the wrong reason, if you think you're like the, I mean the um, classic studies of like the bridge study with a misattribution of arousal. So it's it's not really that you could say that one state is more or less accurate. It's really going to depend on the psychological appraisal of the person. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Will. Um, so that wraps up the time that we have for questions. Um, just to let everybody know, um, the slides will be. Um, available to you after the fact, um, and after today's presentation, um, we'll send out information about how to access a recording of the talk um, that Will gave today. So I just want to give a big thank you to Will for this great introduction to cardiovascular psychophysiology. I know this is an area that I didn't have any previous knowledge about, and I personally learned a lot, so thank you, Will. Um, and I also wanted to thank APAGS and SPIFI for supporting today's event. Oh, um, so, so look welcome. for an email. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. Um, so look for an email with information about how to access the slides and that recording. Uh, we've got one webinar left in this year's methodology series, so we hope to see you on that webinar uh, on July 13th. And thanks for joining us today, and I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day, everyone. Thanks for bearing with me, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Will. Well done. Thanks, Will.